Once again, let's look at verse number 1 and read down to verse number 4. The Bible says here, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me." Now, this year, as we have been focusing uh, our church on getting connected to God and trying to encourage people to have a relationship with God and a, a walk with God and, and ultimately for that connection with God to grow stronger and stronger, we have looked at this passage of Scripture a number of times and we have talked about the context of this scripture. I thought it would be fitting for the series that I would like for us to jump into next to start here. Because let me remind you the setting uh, of this passage. Jesus, as we have already learned, was uh, there with his disciples in the upper room. They observed the Passover and he instituted what we now observe called the Lord's Supper. And he, after they finished with the Lord's Supper, they went ahead and left that upper room and began making their way to the Mount of Olives because at the Mount of Olives was a place by the name of the Garden of, by the name of Gethsemane. It was a garden and there Jesus was going to pray with his disciples. And as he is walking with his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane, he gives them this challenge as well as what we found in John chapter number 14, the challenge in verse number six, I am the way, the truth and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. He is speaking to the 11. The 12th disciple, Judas, has gone off to get those that are going to come and arrest Jesus here in a short time. But there are 11 with him. And I felt that it was fitting for us to start here because now what I'd like for us to do is turn over to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter number 1. And what I want us to study here over uh, the course of the next few months is this thought, connected to the cross. Because you see, amongst the 11 that were walking with Jesus in John chapter number 15 and listening to Jesus give this challenge to abide in Him or to be connected to their Heavenly Father was uh, Simon Peter. And when we think of Peter, Peter outside of the Apostle Paul was probably uh, the greatest preacher or the most widely known preacher among the 11. Uh, he was no doubt the leader of the twelve. Uh, he was the one that Jesus said would be uh, called a, a stone or a rock. And, and really he was. Uh, as Peter went, so went the rest of the disciples. Now so often people remember Peter for denying Jesus three times there as Jesus had been arrested and was now being tried by the religious crowd. But we know what happened in Peter's life and how that really that was a turning point for him when Jesus looked at him after Peter denied him the third time and it motivated Peter to ultimately uh, get his heart and life right with God. Uh, Peter, of course, had an issue with what to do uh, as far as the, with his life. Uh, and so the Lord Jesus appeared to him there at the Sea of Galilee at the end of the book of John and challenged him to feed his sheep, to be a leader to Christians. And in the book of Acts, that's exactly what he did as he preached on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter number two. And then throughout the book of Acts is mentioned as being uh, evangelistic and very proactive in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, with all of that said, historians have recorded that Peter, though he may have denied Jesus three times leading up to the cross, actually died in a similar fashion to Jesus on a cross. He was crucified, the historians write, but he was crucified upside down. And so ultimately, there was a connection to the cross. Peter may have wandered at some point. He may have denied at some point. But there was a, 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 a change in his heart and in his life. And he became devoted and dedicated to his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And now he gets uh, later on in years. And he writes two letters, two epistles 
1st and 2nd Peter. And that's really what this study is going to be. It's going to be a study of these two books. So if you would, let's go ahead and start this off tonight and look at uh, starting in verse number 1, going down uh, to verse number 5. Just the first five verses of this first letter. And I want to try to give you a, a thought to take home with you tonight. First off, in 1 Peter 1, 1, let's read uh, down from verse 1 down to verse 5. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, uh, when we look at this letter and we see by way of introduction, we see who wrote it, who he was writing to in that opening greeting, uh, we see some interesting language here. Ultimately, in verse number one, Peter, just like Paul did in his letters, acknowledges that he is the author of this letter, and then he acknowledges who he is writing to, and then he gives them a greeting. This was sort of the the common uh, sort of the common layout or outline for a letter written by Paul or written by Peter or written by many at that time in the first century. So we see who wrote the letter first, Peter, as he mentions in verse number one. He says he is an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, as we saw from our studies uh, of the letters that Paul wrote, whenever that title, an apostle of Jesus Christ, is written, it is to remind us that this individual who is writing is a messenger, is really a deputized individual, uh, a person who has been given the authority to go ahead and share the information that they later pen in their letter. And so Peter simply introduces himself that way as an apostle of Jesus Christ, a deputized messenger. So what he writes here, he has the authority of Jesus Christ upon it. He has the authority of God the Father upon it. He has the authority of the Holy Spirit of God upon it. We may question sometimes when we hear preachers, when we hear teachers, when we even hear our own pastor. We may question if something that they say is actually uh, inspired or I should say directed by God because there is a human element to preaching and teaching. Uh, But here when we look at this and we see that this was written by Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and we read it and we know what the Bible tells us about the inspiration of the Word of God, then we know that ultimately this was God speaking to man through the hand of Peter, just like he had done through the hand of Paul in 13 different letters in the New Testament. So that's who writes it. Who does he write it to? In verse number 1 he tells us, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now two of these uh, uh, regions we're familiar with. Asia is where Ephesus was located. Galatia, Paul wrote a letter to the Galatians, which was to the churches located in this region. Pontus, Cappadocia, and Bithynia we're not real familiar with. But the point is he's writing to some individuals that he refers to as strangers. Now, why would he use this term? Well, remember in the Old Testament, when the Jews went into the promised land, that a law was given to them, but ultimately they were instructed to keep in mind the strangers. That if a stranger were to come to them, he could live with them if he abided by the law. Well, we are strangers in the world in which we live as Christians. That's acknowledged to us 
over and over again in the scriptures. In Ephesians 2, verse number 12, let me read you a few scriptures. The Bible says that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So in the Old Testament, there were those who were not Jews, they were called strangers. Now in the New Testament, uh, ultimately, as Paul is writing to the church of Ephesus, he says to those that, were not, that are not Jews in this church, hey, you Gentile believers, you were strangers from uh, the, the covenants of promise because you did not, uh, were not uh, taught and did not believe ultimately Judaism, and, which is the Old Testament religion. Uh, uh, but we put the Old Testament, New Testament together to get Christianity. And he says, you were strangers. But then in verse number 19 of that same chapter, Ephesians 2, he says, now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners. And he goes on to say about fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. He says, just like in the Old Testament, there were strangers, people who were not part of the nation of Israel, but were allowed to uh, come and live among the nation of Israel and among the Jews. You Gentiles were not part of the promise. Uh, the promise was given to the Jews, but because of Jesus Christ, you now are no longer strangers because you have put your faith and trust in the Son of God who is able to save Jew and and Gentile. He's able to save man and woman, boy and girl. He's able to save anyone because he came and died for all sinners. In Hebrews chapter number 11, Hebrews chapter number 11 and verse number 13, the author of the book of Hebrews writes here, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So ultimately now, we as Christians are not strangers to God because we're saved. We're not strangers to the promises that were given to the people of God because we are his children. We are born again, but we are strangers now to this world. I would compare it this way. The, in uh, Paul's writings, Paul talked about how that uh, we were once a servant to sin but now we're free. And as free men, we are servants to God. So ultimately in this life, we are always a servant. Before we were saved, we were a servant to sin. But now we are a servant to God. The difference is we have a choice in our servitude. God wants us to choose to serve Him all the time, but we are not forced. We are given a choice. Well, in the same manner, before we were saved, we were strangers to God. But now that we are saved, we're strangers to this world. Uh, the, the world does not recognize us as its own anymore. Here in 1 Peter, in fact, uh, a chapter later, in chapter 2 and verse number 11, notice how Peter, uh, 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 I guess you could say, acknowledges or addresses these believers. He says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. So, Peter's writing this letter. He's writing it to these strangers, born-again believers, those who the world considers strangers or outsiders, but in God's eyes are fellow citizens, are children of God. And we know that because not only the fact that he uses the word stranger there, but he goes on in verse number two to tell us more about them. He says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. So he uses that word elect. That word elect means to choose. When we have an election this fall, what are we going to do? We are going to choose a president, as well as other political figures. We are going to choose. Remember, God has chosen us but he hasn't chosen us in this predestination way that Calvinists believe. Calvinists believe that God looked down at the earth and he simply chose, he picked and chose who was going to be saved and who was going to go to hell. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that God looks down from heaven and he chooses those who choose him. So 
ultimately, think back to Abraham. Think back to Noah. Separated these men uh, from those that lived during their time. Ultimately, it was faith. It wasn't their action. It wasn't because of their actions that God said, oh, you know what, I'm going to pick that person. And by the way, it wasn't before their faith that God said, I'm going to pick that person. But ultimately, because of their faith, God said, you know what, you chose me, I choose you. Similar to a marriage relationship. Two people walk down the aisle, or excuse me, one person walks down the aisle, the other comes out maybe from the side, and they're joined at the front uh, in holy matrimony. And what are they saying? I choose you. The groom says, I choose you to the bride, and the bride says to the groom, I choose you. So ultimately, when we see that word elect, or when we see this uh, being taught about election, what it is is it's God choosing us because we chose him. And so here the Bible tells us that these people were the elect. Notice, we're not going to take a lot of time to look at this, but notice too that in this verse, verse number two, you see God the Father, God the Spirit, and God the Son all mentioned salvation was made possible because all three had a part. Just like in the creation of the world. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit were all three present and all three had a part in the creation of the world. And today, when a person gets saved, every, uh, uh, in every part of the, the, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, has a part. It says that God the Father's part was the foreknowledge, knowing ahead of time that there was going to be a need for a Messiah or a Savior. That the, saint, the Spirit's part is sanctification, setting that individual apart, setting them apart from their sin and from the world. And then the, the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, His part was the shedding of blood. He was obedient unto death, and His blood was that sacrifice that was necessary. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sins. And so that sprinkling of the blood refers to the Old Testament when they would take the blood of the Lamb, which Jesus was the Lamb of God, and they would sprinkle it on the altar. And so all three parts or all three persons of the Trinity are represented here. Tonight, if you are saved, it took God the Father's foreknowledge, God the Son's sacrifice, and God the Holy Spirit's sanctification. And tonight, the Holy Spirit still lives inside of you. And tonight, you and I, this letter is to us as much as it was to those in the first century, because tonight, we are the elect of God. We are the born-again believers. Now, with that in mind, real quickly, we see the greeting at the end of verse number 2, and then I, we'll get right into the, the main point uh, of verses 3, 4, and 5 that I want you to take home with you. Notice that Peter writes, Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. This is the same exact uh, uh, greeting that Paul uses in every letter he wrote. If you go back and start in Romans and go all the way up uh, to the last letter that Paul wrote, uh, you'll find that in every letter he opened these letters uh, all the way up to Philemon with the words grace and peace. Grace and peace. Grace and peace. Once again, now think about why that was necessary. Because this is the first century. This is when Christians are being persecuted. That's why he called these strangers, these born-again believers, the scattered. So there was a need to be reminded that God's grace or favor was there. And to be reminded to have peace. Because they were living in uh, times of turmoil. By the way, we need that reminder tonight as well. If we do believe that Jesus Christ's coming is nearing with every day, then we need to be reminded as we see these things happening in our country and these awful things happening in our world, we need to be reminded of the grace of God, the favor of God that has been bestowed upon us, and also the peace of God is still real and that we can enjoy it. But Peter does something that Paul didn't do. He actually adds the phrase, be multiplied. So grace and peace. Now we get to the main point of verses 3, 4, and 5, and I'll be brief with this real quickly here tonight. Notice in verse number 3 that Peter writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ultimately, he starts out this letter after acknowledging who he is, addressing 
uh, the letter to the strangers uh, of these regions and then greeting them, he uh, bestows a blessing upon God in heaven, our heavenly Father. But notice how he calls him, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. If we had time tonight, I could take you starting in Matthew chapter number 26 and verse number 39 and show you how that Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane prayed and referred to God in heaven as His Father. And then in Matthew chapter number 27 and verse number 46 and referred to Him as His God. He said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And in Mark 15, 34, the same thing occurs. But then in Luke 23, verse 46, where after His resurrection, He refers to God again as His heavenly Father. Ultimately, we always acknowledge that our heavenly Father uh, was and is Jesus' heavenly Father, but we don't acknowledge the fact that our God was Jesus' God. He's His God. He appears to Him as God, Lord Jesus. Now, the purpose of that is to remind us that ultimately the Father, the preeminent Father, God the Son, not come. We are called Christians. We are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. He is our Savior. He is our Lord. Ultimately, God God. God is the Father of heaven. He bestows this thing upon God the Father. Our God. And the God of Jesus Christ he bestows the blessing. Now, bestow upon God in heaven. Well, he mentions here in verse 9, which according to abundantly begotten. And really, if we give this challenge to the opening chapter, a time, that's what we would be got. Because in the these three verses, verses 3, 4, and 5, he talks about three things that we were begotten to. Now that word begotten means to be procreated, to be generated, to be produced. Ultimately, when you think about that, he says that he hath begotten us again. See, God created all of us. Even though the scientists and the PhDs of today may not want to admit it, God did create all of us. He formed us. He fashioned us. As He told Jeremiah, He knew us in our mother's womb. God has known all of us. God makes no mistakes. Those little children that come out and they're born with ailments and, and, and defects, uh, God didn't make a mistake there. God knew them and He allowed that to happen. As I was sharing the challenge to the young people uh, uh, around the, the camp uh, camping area that we had up there in, in Briceburg yesterday. I was sharing with my kids and, and, and my nieces and nephews in John chapter number 9 how that Jesus said about the blind man to his disciples about the blind man that ultimately he was made blind or he was allowed to be blind so that the glory of God could be manifest in him. Hey, every one of these situations, God knows these individuals. God knows these children. God knows these adults that have been born with these ailments. And you know what? We may look at them and we may feel for them and we may have pity on them, but God looks at them with loving eyes because they're His creation. He created them. Now someone says, what did he, why did He create them that way? Well, once again, we know that all things work together for good. God uses everything to bring us in closer fellowship with Him. Nonetheless, He says here that we've been begotten again. He created us once, and now He's producing us a second time. This time spiritually. Reminds me of the story. Uh, there was a lot of books that were given to us when we were missionaries so that we could use overseas. And one of them was a story about a little boy who uh, he made this little sailboat and he took the sailboat down to the river and he was playing it with the river at the river and he would let it go out a little bit and he had a little pull line on it and he'd pull it back and he'd let it go out and he'd pull it back and then finally one time he let it out and he lost the line and it started sailing away 
And he went home crying. He was obviously distraught. He had spent so much time uh, with that, that wood, shaping it. And then once he got it exactly how he wanted it, painting it and putting the sail on it. And he was so discouraged and so brokenhearted until he was walking down the street one day and he looked in the window of a little toy store and he saw his boat there for sale. And he got all excited and he went inside and he said, Mr., Mr., that's my boat. And the man said, no, I'm sorry, son, I found that boat. And he goes, yeah, but that's my boat. And he said, I know that's my boat. I, I made it. I fashioned it. I shaped it. That's my boat. And he goes, I'm sorry, son, but if you want that boat, you're going to have to buy it. And the little boy looked at the price tag in the window and he thought, man, that's my boat. I should have that boat, but I have to buy it. And so he went home and he told his father and he started working and he, he did chores and odds and ends and earned all the money that he could. And he went back into that toy store and he handed that toy store clerk that money and he took that boat and when he grabbed that boat and he was walking out of that little toy store he said now you're mine twice i made you and i bought you and ultimately that's what uh, peter's talking about here when he says that he has begotten us again god made us and he bought us and he paid the most expensive price you could pay his only begotten son by the way this is just a little side note tonight if a Mormon tries to come and tell you that Jesus and Satan were brothers, tell him to look up John 3.16. It says, only begotten son. He didn't have two sons, one named Satan or Lucifer and one named Jesus. He had one son named Jesus Christ. That was his only begotten son. And by the way, that sort of goes back to what we saw in the book of, uh, uh, of uh, Colossians. Uh, how, or excuse me, in 1 Corinthians on Sunday night, how that uh, Paul said if they come preaching another Jesus, guess what? That Jesus that they preach at the Mormon church, that's not my Jesus. Because my Jesus didn't have a brother named Lucifer. My, my Jesus, he had a heavenly father. He knew the Holy Spirit, but he didn't have a brother named Lucifer. That's just a side note thing. So real quickly here. He says there's three things that you've been got, begotten to, that you've been ultimately uh, procreated for or produced uh, uh, I guess you could say four. Let me give them to you real quickly here. Verse number three. He says, first off, hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. First off, he says, you've been begotten again to a hope. This hope is not just an ordinary hope. As I've said many times before, whether you're a baseball fan, a football fan, a basketball fan, or a fan of no sport, and you wish all sports would just be outlawed, uh, you have hope tonight. If you're a sports fan, you have hope for your teams. If you hate sports, you have a hope that one day they're going to outlaw all sports, all right? But the point is you have a hope tonight. But the truth is, is that many people's hope is not very real. You know, when we think about sports, we won't go Dodgers-Giants tonight. Let's go Raiders tonight. Raiders fans... Before the last couple years, they have had very little hope that they would win anything. But their team's gotten better and better. So now they have more hope. But a couple years ago, they really their hope was not a realistic hope. Now they have a realistic hope. You know what he says? He says, you tonight, those of you that are strangers, those of you that are elect, those of you that are born again, you have a hope and it's not a little hope. It's a lively hope. That means it is alive. Why is it alive? It's alive because the person who gives us hope is alive. Notice in verse number 3 he says, "...hath begotten us again unto a lively hope." How? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Hey, that's why in Titus 2.13 it says, "...looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ." Hey, Ultimately, we have a hope tonight and our hope is lively because our hope is in Jesus who is not dead. He is risen as He said. He is alive. Now, think again about who He's writing to 
when he writes these words. He is writing to first century Christians who have been scattered through these regions, who are going by the name of strangers. They're just be being given this title because of the persecution under the Roman Empire. And he says, hey, tonight we should be able to bless our God and our Heavenly Father because he has begotten us, he has pre procreated us, or generated us, or made us into a people that have a hope, a lively hope. And then he gives a second thing here in verse number four, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. He says, second, you've been begotten to an inheritance. Hey, tonight, not only do you have a lively hope, but you have an inheritance. And notice what he says about that inheritance or how he describes it. He says it is an incorruptible and undefiled inheritance. In other words, it's not going to rot away. Tonight, if you have a wealthy uh, parent or uh, relative who said to you, you know what, I'm going to leave you my house when I die. I'm going to leave you my car. Oh, it's a beauty. I fixed it up. It's got a nice new uh, paint job on it and everything. I'm going to leave you my house. I'm going to leave you my car. Guess what? Give it time, and those things are going to be corrupted by rust. Yep. And that house will be corrupted by insects. And, and, and the clothing of this world is corrupted by moth. And that's why Jesus said, Hey, lay up not your treasures where moth and, and, and rust doth corrupt, but lay up your treasures in heaven. He says, You have an inheritance that's not corrupted. It's an inheritance that's not defiled. It's not tainted. In other words, you didn't have to do something devious, sinister, under the table to get it. It's not a defiled inheritance. It's also an inheritance that fadeth not away. In other words, it's not here today and gone tomorrow. And he says in verse number four, reserved in heaven for you. You know what? I haven't been to a lot of these restaurants, but I like it when you go to one of those fancy restaurants that has to take reservations. I think I've been to just a couple of those. And you, you go and you say, uh, yes, uh, I have reservations. Oh, yes, what's, what, what's your name? Uh, and you give them your name. And they say, right this way. They saved that for you. Nobody's going to take that table. Why? Because it's reserved for you. He says, tonight you have an inheritance. It's incorruptible. It's undefiled. It's not going to vanish away. And it's reserved for you. Nobody else. It can't be taken away. I like what one of the preachers down there at Master's Men said. He was talking about John 14. And he says, I know that a lot of these other versions of the Bible want to re replace mansion with rooms. He said, I'm looking forward to a mansion, not a room. Thank you. I think even Brother Josh might have said that in his testimony on Sunday night. Hey, we have ma a mansion in heaven that Jesus is preparing for us. And guess what? On the sign, on the front door, until we get there, it says reserved. In other words, if Brother G gets there before me, I don't have to worry about him hanging a giant's flag in the window, amen? Because it's reserved. Hey, it's yours. Nobody's going to take it. It's all for you. Remember once again who he's writing to. He's writing to a people that are being oppressed. He's writing to a people that are being burdened down by the Roman Empire. And he says, be encouraged tonight. Bless your God. Bless your heavenly Father because he's begotten you to a lively hope. He's begotten you to an inheritance that is yours. And then finally, in verse number 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. He says, you've been begotten to power. To power that is godly power. He says here, who are kept by the power of God. Now the fact that I have a lively hope and you have a lot tonight, that, that is great. And the fact that we have an inheritance and one day we are going to see that inheritance, that's great. But you know the biggest comfort of all is knowing that we have tonight God's power that keeps us. His power that protects us. We were reading a story this morning in 
devotions. I took my wife and kids over to Brother Frank's house, and he has a different devotion book than us. Those of you that have the rooted devotion book probably read this devotion this morning. And in there, it talked about, uh, there was a story about a young man. He was a young Indian boy, and when he got to a certain age, I think it was 12 or 13, to prove himself a man or to prove that he had become a man, he had to go out and stay by himself overnight in the woods. And so he made himself his way out into the woods, away from the village, and he made camp where he was going to uh, sleep for the night. And of course, as a young boy still, uh, there were things going through his mind, and he was concerned, and, and obviously he had some worries. Was there an animal that might attack? him in the middle of the night or whatnot and he went to sleep and he woke up the next morning and when he woke up he happened to look out off into the distance a little ways through the timber and he noticed that his father was standing there and his father had a, a bow drawn in his hand later on he found out that yes he had been sent out on his own to prove that he was a man but through it all his father had followed behind him and was watching over him the whole night with a bow drawn in case something were to attack. Hey, we may feel as though we are strangers and pilgrims in this world, and we may feel as though sometimes we are alone, but it's nice to know tonight that we are kept by the power of God, that our Heavenly Father is watching over us, and there is no attack that comes our way that He does not see and that He cannot protect us from or He cannot provide for us in that time of need. Peter says to these believers, Hey, strangers, I'm talking to some strangers tonight. If you're not born again, then you need to get born again. But if you are saved, you're a stranger to this world. Hey, tonight, you have a hope. Don't, let, don't get discouraged. Don't let Satan steal your joy. You have hope. It's a lively hope. You have an inheritance. And one day, you're going to be able to see that inheritance. You're going to be able to enjoy that inheritance. But right now, just be reminded... You have protection. You are kept by the power of God. And there is nothing that can happen to you that your Heavenly Father does not allow. Because He knows what's going to make you stronger. He knows what's going to make you better. He knows what's going to make you run to Him. And so tonight, let me encourage you, no matter what you're going through, to remember these things that you have been begotten. Father, thank You for all that You've done for us. Thank You for all that You've given to us. Lord, I pray that You'd help us now as we have started this new series.